music in the first place is like an, an expression of, of art. And like, I'm not making music, I'm not making an album because I want to run ads with it specifically. I'm making it because I'm, I'm like artistically compelled to. So if you're artistically compelled to make a music video, then you should do that. You should not not do it. I would not assert that it is the best way to expose yourself to new people. In most, most cases, it is more expensive and, and, and time consuming and laborious than it is uh, tangibly fruitful. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 209, and we're going to get pretty freaking nerdy about video and creating badass videos on this episode. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me is my co-host, Ed Isola, and our special guest today, Mr. Michael Kessler, who is the head of all things video here at Indopreneur. He goes by the artist name Kaitoon, and it's his first time on Creative Juice it's certainly not his first time uh, seeing <laughs> anything related to Creative Juice. Michael, welcome to the show, man. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's about damn time. I uh, <laughs> uh, I've, I edited the podcast. Uh, for those who don't know, that's what Jack was referring to. I, I used to edit. I edited like 70 episodes or something. I don't know. Um, almost that many. And now, now we pass it on to Amanda Duncan. But yeah, I'm certainly familiar with the formula for the show and uh, glad to be here to say stuff in words. Yeah, stoked to have you here. No, I was gonna say, I'm stoked to have you. I'm excited. I think at the end of the last episode, I made a very clear underline of how little I know about video editing. So we've, I'm, I'm glad we have the complete opposite here in you today. The video editing is my forte. That's really what, what got me into it, so. We're all the more blessed for it. <laughs> That's for sure. Give us a little bit of background on you, man. I mean, like, obviously, like, you are kind of like the overseer of all things creative and video here at Entrepreneur HQ, but you're also an artist for yourself and you make a lot of music um, and you've put out some pretty, what I think is some of the most hilarious video content that I've seen from artists. And I know you've also done a lot of work on music videos and video production for a number of other artists. So feel free to give our listeners just the rundown on you, your artistry, and the, the lay of the land about what you do. Yeah, here's a, you know, I'll, I'll try and give a, a brief synopsis. I uh, I go by my, my I have a mu- music project called Kytoon. I started making electronic music when I was 12 years old. So that was the genesis, um, like techno stuff. And then now it's, it's much more elaborate. And I sing and produce and, 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 you know, play multiple instruments and the whole shebang um and and i guess that was my main segue into video was making video content for kytoon um originally music music videos my first music video in 2015 was was a pretty pivotal moment for me oh, because man. um yeah it uh it turned out really well and i grew up with some like movie geeks and like film uh, aspiring filmmakers who you know kind of got me into that realm one of my one of my closest friends went to usc for script writing and he's still working uh down there in, in los angeles so he's he's manifested that dream and I, he helped me with this music video in 2015 and uh it all turned out great we produced it and shot it really well you know, with super low budget cameras. But when it came to the editing phase, we uh, asked a couple of favors from friends to edit it because I assumed I wasn't the best person to do it. Like I, I wasn't really at that point interested in working in, in video or film or anything. And I knew how to edit just like everybody does, but I, you know, it wasn't really like my, my, my calling per se. And uh, so we passed it off to a good friend who did not deliver an acceptable product and I love him to death. And I think, you know, I think he had a lot going on too and maybe couldn't fully invest in it, but it turned out really uh, not good. And I immediately recognized 
that that I could probably have done a better job, but we ended up trying. I, I wasn't I, I wasn't like on an ego trip about it. It was just like they're just it was just so obviously um, subpar. So we asked another friend to do it. Not, not even a not even a close friend. He's like an un- underclassman. This was in high school. Who who like was verifiably a good video editor at least by high school standards. Like that was his thing. He was. He, he wanted to be a professional video editor. He, he edited all the, you know, like school network videos and whatnot and like knew how to do special effects. And uh, he did a horrible job as well. Like, like he just clearly didn't want to do it. I don't get why he agreed to do it in the first place. Was this a music video for Kytoon? Yeah, this is a, a Kytoon music video, which is why I was so invested in it. So ultimately I ended up out of necessity, I did it myself and um, I think I did a pretty pretty darn good job and also realized uh, I kind of enjoyed doing it. I think I put, uh, it's, uh, not everyone has a, has a knack for video editing. Most people don't like doing it. Most people actually find it the least pleasant part of the whole experience, which is a clear indication that you should not be doing it um, on, a, on, a, on that level anyway. I mean, do, video, editing video out of necessity is something that everybody should be able to do, but you shouldn't volunteer to edit like a like a full scale music video if you hate doing it. I just it it's <laughs> it's not a means to an end. It's it is like the it is the final phase of, of production. It's like where everything comes together. It's where so many important decisions are made uh creatively. Yeah, I kinda just started to develop an affection for it around that time. I ended up getting an internship. So I went to school for music business. I did internships at artist management at an artist management company here in Nashville and I was on a digital media team. And that's really just how I fell into this as a career because they ended up pawing off all the video tasks to me because I was the most competent person there. It just kept happening. And then they hired me and did it even more. And then I worked there for four years and left and I'm still doing it. So that's the the short of it, I guess, from that point. I don't know if I'd uh, be doing it full-time professionally if it weren't for that particular job. It makes sense, but I went to, I didn't go to school for this stuff in particular. It's the, uh, it's the music aspect of it that, that sucked me in. That's really interesting. Like your artistry kind of, and your interest in, in the music business is kind of what kind of continued to propel you into the video world after you kind of found yourself in this trial by fire situation that was related to your to your music, to a project that you were super invested in. You were like, well, third time's a charm. Like if the first two editors totally missed the mark <laughs> on what you were trying to bring to life. I think that's wild. I mean, that's super cool. I definitely know the feeling of if you want something done right as an artist, like sometimes you feel like you have to do it yourself and then you find yourself doing something that you actually end up liking. Yeah, that really defines almost everything that I do for Kytoon, my music project. I am a, a control freak where that is concerned. Anything that I feel like I can do competently, I want to do. And that's not the best habit. Have, <laughs> but sometimes it works out really well and you end up doing it for a living. So that was cool. I think that's a pretty interesting sort of spot to kind of turn the page like i'm curious you've produced music videos for plenty of artists and you've done plenty for yourself and certainly like a lot of also non-music video work as well um both here and i imagine out you know outside of entrepreneur where do you find or, or what tips would you give to artists that are thinking about like how to make their videos better i want to get into the subject of like music videos in general in, in a little bit here ed and i are kind of like chomping at the bit a, a little to talk about that in particular but Something that I think a lot of artists struggle with is making great video content. And we've talked about this plenty throughout the last few episodes, you know, what to do with video content once you create it, that it's in a place that you're really, really happy with it. But I think something that a lot of people struggle with is both in the ideation, production and post-production phases. I think there kind of exist challenges at all of them. And one of them that Ed and I have talked about a lot is this idea of like song choice and then using that to inform the rest of your production process. So I'm curious if you have any opinions or, or thoughts on that. And also just like where your process starts as far as ideation goes when it comes to creating video ads, whether it be for you know music videos or fan finders or opt-in ads, sales videos, whatever it might be. Yeah, well, I mean, there are a lot of ways to 
attack of that question, I'll start with music selection. That's that's a big, a, a huge part of it, especially for top of funnel video content as a musician. Anything top of funnel should feature your music first and foremost, and and uh, it, it's got to be in the spirit of a pattern interrupt. It's got to be you got to be putting the best high impact moments of your discography up front. But when it comes to comes to video content and, and performance stuff, there's more to consider than than the song. You know, I mean, how interesting a performance it may make also factors into it. But I'm trying to cook up some some more fan finder stuff for my own music project, and the songs that I'm picking are what I feel like are the the not the least dense, but the most accessible and immediately and widely interesting which you know maybe a common sense thing you don't necessarily want to put like the secret bonus track on your album and your ep up front as a as a fan finder because that's probably the most you know avant-garde thing that you have but not like avant-garde is intrinsically bad though just think <laughs> if there's a piece of music in, in your catalog or even a section of music if if we're doing you know since we, I don't know, we might be moving away from like full length performance videos, like on, you know, TikTok, for example, although they did, I, I realized they just uh, increased the video length limit, but still let's just, you know, for assuming one minute is the ideal length. If there's a one minute piece of music in your catalog that is like the thesis statement of who you are as an artist, you should try and make a video out of that. That makes a lot of sense. As far as what works and what, what people react to, I don't know, it really depends on, on your audience, but you definitely just want to put your best foot forward musically. Uh, yeah, I really, I'll contradict myself over and over again though, because <laughs> if there's a particular song that you have that like makes for a really interesting performance, like it's a, if it's a solo thing and you're playing a bunch of instruments all at once, for, for instance, then I think that's absolutely worth trying to make a video out of. I've visualized every song from my last album as a performance and that's that informs which videos i go forward with because there's some videos that just or some songs for instance that like maybe don't work super well stripped down i have a lot of synth stuff going on i want a performance video to be you know more more acoustic if possible or if it if i am doing full band you know i want to really do it and reproduce the sound of the record because again this is this is top of funnel it's not necessarily an alternate rendition of the song which would be like a great piece of like a, like nur nurturing content or for people who've already heard the original you know that's always super cool but dude that's a really interesting point that you have about like i visualize like like essentially i think what you just said was like when i'm writing the songs i visualize what the video or the performance video could be like and i'm curious to, for you to dig more into that mostly because i do the exact same thing when i'm writing songs i'm like how is this going to translate into a video and i think that that combination is something i haven't thought about before that kind of helps inform me around what song is going to be my fan finder video you know i'm curious in that process have you ever had something where it's like well here's my favorite song on the album but I think that this will make a way cooler visual video, therefore I'm gonna do this. If you can just give a little more insight to that wherever you can, I think that's a really important key to like maybe somebody listening in terms of like, okay, how do I narrow down the video into, there's say there's 10 songs on an album, like how do I pick which song I'm doing first? And, and I think strength of video idea is something to consider when you're writing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's a song on your record that is has that's that's a great concept for a video and it's just it just immediately like you just immediately know what the video is going to be and like where it's going to take place and you know how it's going to sound sonically. That's probably a good and a clear indication if that just comes to you naturally that that's a good choice. In my like own personal experience with my record, my very first fan finder wasn't necessarily my favorite track on the album, but I knew exactly what to do with it. It was, uh, it's called Darker Days. If uh, if you guys have seen it, it's the one where I'm in my bedroom with like, you know, four other musicians. Oh yeah, I know that, I know that video. 
Yeah, it turned out great. It performed really well. I chose that one because first I, I did think it was a really strong song and I wouldn't have picked it if it weren't for that reason. It doesn't have acoustic drums. There's, it's just an 808 drum pad the whole time, which was, which automatically, you know, lowered the barrier for the technological barrier anyway. I didn't even own a drum set at that point. So we used the 808, which meant we could all cram into the space. And um, like I was going DI into my computer for everything. So technically it was really easy to do. And I knew I could make it sound good. Also like part of this is working within what my limitations at the time, but also the song is like about depression and like not being able to get out of bed and everything. And there's a great prosody between the video and, and the music in this instance, prosody being like a word that I picked up in college for some reason that just they enhance each other. They, they pair very, very well thematically. That's really interesting because like I was saying, you are down the road, right? With your understanding, obviously of video editing, but just digital marketing and, and you've, you've made a handful of videos before. Have you found that like the process has changed in terms of coming up with ideas like your, your first video was that one that you were saying you just knew immediately what you wanted the video to be and then how does that compare to as you're brainstorming videos now because I, I think something that's important to drive home is is really like what makes a good video right like the pattern interrupts that kind of stuff because for me I now have a really strong understanding of what things should look like from an ad front just by learning about the fan finder and running campaigns and stuff like that that even when I'm writing new songs, I sometimes adapt the songs into like, oh man, it'd be really cool to have a stomp clap part for a video. So let me put one in the song, you know, like that kind of thing. That's such a, a long running thing in, in rock and roll. I mean, some of the most legendary bands wrote songs for those those kinds of moments, just like in a live setting, you know, that's not unprecedented. And it's, it's pretty it's pretty smart to do. It is certainly trickled into the way I write and produce music a little bit. I do have a lot of layers and everything that I write. Sometimes I'm tempted not to multi-track a bunch because I'm afraid it'll make it hard to reproduce live or or something. But there's always a way to it to adapt that stuff is what I realized. So that's that's a little bit different in that like I'm concerned with like the technical side of it. But when it comes to like generating ideas for videos, I, I do for sure give preference to songs with moments like that that are just guaranteed to be visually engaging or or high energy. Something with a lot of movement can be really good or like I'm really into like <laughs> sometimes what I'm into and what performs well aren't the same thing because I'm really into into instrumental moments. But then again, like I don't know, I get a ton of guitar uh, guitar fans who like my last fan finder really resonated with guitar people because I just had I have like solos and everything that I do, and I make sure to record those really well. Like I strap a GoPro to the neck of my guitar. So I've always got a great angle of that. For people who can appreciate, like if your pattern interrupt is an impressive instrumental solo, the GoPro on the neck of the instrument is like very, very much a tried and true. And it's a very compelling shot too. It's pretty wild because it like moves around with your guitar or bass or, or, or what have you. I did buy one and like I, every video that I imagine recording it involves that for sure so I can capture these moments. I'm planning on going all out with this video that I'm cooking up for the next month or so. There's stuff like that happening with every instrument and I know how I'm gonna edit it. I'm gonna have like five cameras because I want a camera pointed at every instrument so I can cut to it every time something interesting happens. And I kinda wanna see how that performs. I feel like the GoPro on the neck, especially if somebody listening is like instrumental, that feels like a huge hack that I have never thought about before. Because a lot of times it's like, well, how do I make an instrumental video cool? And even without seeing this, I, I can visualize like, oh man, I probably would stop and watch somebody ripping a guitar solo down the neck. That would just look cool. So I feel like that is something if you're an instrumentalist or that's like a part of your music to kind of really maybe put in the back of your head. The thing that I'm thinking about is like what you just said, how you approach your videos. How many fan finder videos have you filmed at this point? I've only put out two. I've been like really dragging my feet on a whole bunch of new ones that I want to do. Cool. But, no, but, but you've done it a few times. So like, is there something that you inherently are trying to, I guess, like what is the narrative throughout those videos? And I guess if I can explain that more clearly, I think helping people think cohesively about how they're making videos as they get into like their second, third video 
it's cool because uh, a couple episodes back, I was telling Jack, like, I know when the 502s are making a video, we want it to be, have this like, oh, dang, this is awesome thing up front, right? And for us, that's either good harmonies or a lot of energy. Like those are our two things. And I would venture to guess that every video we ever make will have one of those two things at the start in some capacity. And so I'm aware for myself that like that's our bread and butter that people like. Is, is there something similar for you that you're like, hey, here's what I know people are gonna resonate with, so let me try to incorporate that up front. And the reason I ask is that I, th I think this is a good exercise for people listening to think about too, because ultimately at the end of the day, I think that there's one or two things that you do as an artist that really catch people's attention. And the more in touch with that you can be, the better you can implement it into your videos, the better you can implement it into the writing of your songs, and then ultimately into your marketing. So I'm just curious if you've seen any parallels like to my experience there. Yeah, I mean, as far as my own personal music, I think I am still figuring it out. I'm, I'm planning on trying a, a, a bunch of different things this year. I've realized and I've I've shied away from this in the past, but like at the bare minimum, your video should start with your face or someone's face, like a clear shot of someone's face. I would defer to starting with a great vocal hook or a harmony. A harmony is a, is a is a great like immediately engaging thing. Harmonies happening in real time are very interesting to people visually and to listen to. Also, also just like an interesting shot in general also goes a long way. And I'm going to try a video like that, like a, a single take shot or a single take video that just opens up and it's just like immediately like, bam, you know, you know what's going on. The your face on camera thing or like somebody in the band's face, that's such a good point. It's so easily overlooked. Yes, yes, exactly. It's so easy to overlook that. And it's like, as soon as you said that, I was like, yeah, all the videos that I've worked with for myself and for MDX people have had somebody's face that have performed really well. It's like the one thing you need to make sure you absolutely do. Yeah, it's like cut out the you know nature pan shot at the first 40 seconds of the video and just go right for the face, which is a really, like, like Jack said, easy to miss, but that's a really great kind of pointer. Are there any things around like cameras that like camera angles specifically that you would say, oh, here's like an easy tip. And this might be something like, oh, if you tilt the ang if you tilt the camera downward or upward, like, you know, it creates a really cool kind of opening shot. I'm just curious, that might be a no, but these are things as someone that doesn't do a lot of work with cameras that it's, it would be interesting to know if there's an easy, easy to implement opening shot just based off camera positioning. Yeah, I think there are real rules of thumb with this stuff and depending on how, you know, dressed up you want it to be, there there's definitely a lot I, I could say. More important than camera angles, I think, is lighting. And I mean not that not that the camera angle isn't important, but like there's focus and, and lighting. I see a lot of stuff that's out of focus or poorly lit that just immediately undoes the expensive camera, the expensive camera that you're shooting on, it'll it'll totally work against you. But I think the most compelling thing as far as setting up a shot that looks good and like has like emotional heft to it maybe, or just something that's visually striking is shooting with a shallow depth of field, which blurs out your, your background basically. It, it, it narrows the focus range. So what's in focus is in focus and everything that isn't is blurred out. You need a wider aperture lens for it to look really good. You can't really do that with an iPhone or a camcorder, but if you're shooting with a DSLR, you want to open up the aperture all the way and give yourself some space between you and your background. So that effect is a little more pronounced. That's probably my top answer for that is just putting space between you and your background. Not don't, you know, don't shoot something backed up against a wall because it's just not going to look, it's not going to look great or super professional. That's really good insight though, because those are things that, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, oh, make sure the lighting's good. You know, I would just assume like, oh, if I can see in my apartment, it's probably fine to film. And I think that's something a lot of other people probably would think too. As uninformed as that opinion is, you know, it's like before Circa set me up with this big lighting rig for the podcast, I really had no idea or respect of what good lighting was. So, and the tip about leaving room between the performing band and the back wall is really good too. So. Those are kind of like maybe even beginner tips that are really easy to implement, hopefully, 
but make a big difference in just the quality of the video, which is, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like that's like nuggets of gold, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I think like those are such simple concepts to grasp, but if you're not told them or, or if you don't know how to find them, you could search around for years, kind of just grasping at straws being like, why are my videos not coming out the way I want them to? And this could apply to like videos that you just make for covers for YouTube, or it could apply to like your music videos or you know, the videos that you run your ads for. I totally agree with Ed there. I'm curious, Michael, what do you think? We've been talking a lot about like music video stuff and how to create like killer music video content and, and song selection and all of that good stuff. But going beyond that, when it comes to things like video ads, whether it's putting a video out there for your fans for a giveaway or for some kind of opt-in opportunity or for sales, we talk a lot about like pattern interrupts in video. I'm curious if you have any tips or just like pattern interrupts that are kind of like your favorite go-tos. Obviously for like opt-in ads, like there's, or, or sales ads that are simple ones where you're just, you know, you wave in front of the camera or you hold up a sign or something like that. But I'm curious how you think about that conceptually as a filmmaker when it comes to music related stuff and, and a fan base. It can be vastly different than like someone who's selling a course online or clothes or something like that, you know? Yeah, I kind of like imagine walking down like a busy street or like standing on the side of a busy street. Maybe like, I don't know if I love this visual, but like imagine you're busking, you know, at in Times Square and like isolating any individual's attention requires maybe some kind of gimmick and it is true and, and kind of un unfortunate to put it that way but like grabbing someone's attention cold like someone who's never heard or seen you before on facebook or instagram or tiktok which is tiktok's a little different because it's not a it's not a feed but still applies requires some kind of showmanship up front just to get someone to even even glance at you i personally almost always defer to comedy or something visually attention grabbing i love immediately addressing the person watching the video that's one of my personal favorite things to do as far as rules of thumb go it's an uphill battle and i think you kind of just have to treat it that way don't take anything for granted don't maybe don't in the first three seconds you know don't assume or just really be critical about how interesting what you're doing is or what, what you have planned i'm very much in an experimenting phase with my own stuff but i can just say as far as what works on me as a user of these platforms it's just anything that immediately gets to the point youtube and the way youtube ads work is interesting because you to me because you have to watch the first five seconds and the objective of a good youtube ad is to in those first five seconds compel you to not hit the skip button yeah get them to stay exactly and, which is a little bit different but i'm very resolved in <laughs> hitting the skip button and it takes it takes a lot to get me to voluntarily watch an ad when I came into a place for some other content, you know. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I've, I've talked about this on the show before. One of the reasons that I think YouTube for top of funnel, YouTube ads for top of funnel with traditional music videos is such a poor performer or is so expensive sometimes is because like they're not really suited for that kind of pattern interrupt, but they typically don't have them, you know. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit different on YouTube. What I found <laughs> makes me want to keep watching a video ad on YouTube that's like minutes long is <laughs> something that immediately establishes intrigue or starts a question that you have to keep watching for it to be answered, like some ridiculous setup. I saw some ad and it was like some guy sitting at a desk in what appeared to be like a red void. It was like, it was this really weird room. And like, he's looking directly in the camera. It felt like a very David Lynch type thing. Maybe it was, but I don't know. Like it was very high production value. So that immediately got me interested because it looked really, really good and professionally done, but it was absurd immediately. This was a while ago, but I did keep watching and it ended up being like a, a promo for some show that I'd never heard of and maybe maybe no one else has but on youtube anyway that's what that's what seems to work on facebook or instagram that's interesting like stretching absurdity as a pattern interrupt and using setting in a totally absurd way or like elements in a video in a totally absurd way i got a, a youtube ad 
a couple of weeks ago that was like, it started with somebody's head, like totally blown up, but they were talking as if they were, you know, totally normal. They were just talking head style video. Their head just happened to be huge. Um, that was immediately like pretty jarring and caught my attention. So yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of another interesting element, like taking a setting and making it absurd, taking a, an element and making it absurd. I think that that's like really, really cool and definitely insightful yeah it's like a cold open for a show that's another way to look at it and and absurdity is one direction that could take but i think breaking bad is one of the best examples if you've ever seen breaking bad in the very first episode starts with what is the finale of the episode and it's just like he's not wearing any pants he's standing on the side of the road there are dead bodies in this rv and he's about to he puts a gun to his head and it cuts to the exposition of the show and we find out that he's a high school teacher and it's all like, how do we get from there to there? That formula can work on the smaller scale of a of a music video or a music performance video or, or even an ad. I think even a one minute ad can accomplish that. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, you can like start with the destination and then kind of flash back to the beginning. That's really similar to, I mean, that's a really good suggestion. We've seen people do that with fan finders before where if the best part of the video is the second chorus and that's the part everyone loves, they'll just literally clip that, put it at the start of the video, let it play the 20 or 30 seconds, and then it ends, and then they start the video uh, at the regular beginning. So it's, it's interesting to hear that you also kind of say like, oh, that could be a great thing because it's like, we've seen it done and you're a, you know, you probably won't want me to say this, video genius, and you're recommending it, it's like, you should try that out if maybe you have something that starts a little slower and has a great ending, it could be a really great thing for you. Yeah, a absolutely. Especially if you have a video or a song that really evolves and turns into something else. If I were making a music video for like a client and it was like a professional music video and it, it was purely artistic, I may not do that. I mean, there are a lot of things that I would do differently if I were putting the artistic side of it first. But just practically speaking, that makes for a more engaging video for someone who, again, whose attention you have to fight for. Kind of piggybacking off of that, what do you, this is a topic that has come up a couple times on the show. And at the beginning of the year, we did a predictions episode of our 2022 predictions. And Ed got pretty bold with a hot take and was like, I predict that the music video, as we know it, is dead in 2022. Like he was basically declaring it dead. And I think there's something to that. And like he and I have wrestled with that idea. And like, I know he's kind of even experimenting with like testing it out with the band. But I'm curious, like as a filmmaker, an artist and a video editor, like what do you think about the concept of the narrative kind of music video and its viability as, a, as something that can engage fans whether old but in particular you know new people that you need to fight for their attention it's not the best way to go about it it's not a, it's not a practical thing to do but i wouldn't say that they're not worth doing if it's something that you want to do a narrative music video is and this is not universally true because like i'm immediately thinking about facebook pages that put the giant text over the video with some you know attention grabbing thing like watch this, this is heartbreaking or something like that. That really, you know, annoys me, but it works on a lot of people and it, and it always tells a story. So I guess those do work, that, that would be an argument for it. But generally speaking, like narrative stuff is slow and, and, and it has to build to work. It's a lot harder to pull off as far as like a top of funnel, like engaging thing to like something that's gonna rip someone's attention away from the news feed. But again, not that it's not worth doing. Making narrative music videos is like a, a passion project for me in most cases. And I think it still serves really well as like an education thing or nurturing or, or what have you for your existing audience. And it might even be like a great retargeting thing if you have like a more performance-based music video because performance stuff, especially live performance is always gonna be easier to win people over with or at least garner intrigue with, almost always. I was gonna say with big production music videos that with a lot of inputs that, and, and that turn into like short films in and of themselves. And that's what a lot of music videos are. And that's part of why I like doing them so much because it is bite-sized film projects. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't tell anyone not to do it, especially if they want to, because making 
music in the first place is like an, an expression of, of art and like I'm not making music, I'm not making an album because I want to run ads with it specifically. I'm making it because I'm, I'm like artistically compelled to. So if you're artistically compelled to make a music video, then you should do that. You shouldn't not do it. I would not assert that it is the best way to expose yourself to new people. In most most cases, it is more expensive and, and, and time consuming and laborious than it is uh, tangibly fruitful. I think that that's probably the best uh, guidance that I've heard given on this topic because you kind of lean into that sort of critical thinking that I think a lot of musicians don't necessarily have in mind when it comes to even making a decision to make a music video. It's either concept and art fully takes over or like, I need to make this go viral takes over. And I think that it happens subconsciously, you know, um, depending on depending on who you are and what kind of artist you are. <laughs> I think knowing that you have to kind of make those critical choices is important to know. Yeah, absolutely. You just got to be realistic about why you want to do it. If it's, again, something you're artistically compelled to do. And I am absolutely one of those people. I spent untold hours editing and even before editing it, like the pre-production phase was, was crazy. I did a, a pretty overblown music video over the summer for my song called The News. I'm in a flying trash can the whole time. There's a lot of green screen. Best video. <laughs> Thank you. I think it turned out great. We'll link to that in the show notes for sure. It turned out exactly like I envisioned it. I put a ton of work into it. It was a labor of love. And I at no point expected or, or you know, like deleted myself into believing it was a guaranteed like viral hit. Honestly, you know, being honest with myself up front, it was like, I just want to do this. This is what I do. I like to make videos. I have a very clear, I, have a, I, I can see the concept of this music video so well, and I just want to make it happen. And uh, that's what I did. And I'm still, I'm, I'm very proud of how it turned out. And it's honestly like, as, as a professional, it's like a great portfolio thing for me because those are some of the most complicated special effects I've ever done. So that also helped motivate me to do it. However, did not do a whole lot for me as far as exposure or fan generation. I think it really like did a lot of work establishing my you know artist identity even more. And everyone loves this music video, and um, I uh, will always have this as like a, a retargeting thing. But did not work on cold at all. I could try again. I'd be interested in trying again and seeing how it performs. But it was uh, it was never for that reason. That's super interesting. You basically went into it knowing I'm going to make this because I want to. I know that it's going to serve probably a specific purpose to, you know, the education kind of nurturing stages of the buddy system and maybe not be a top of funnel asset that really does what needs to be done in that space. I think that that's like, you know, that's exactly the kind of critical thinking that doesn't often go into music video creation. So that's super good, <laughs> super good insight. Ed, what's your take on this, knowing that you were the uh, the bearer of the music video death <laughs> spiral? I think Michael summarized in a way more articulate manner what I was trying to say. And I also think he very smartly said, in most cases, so you leave yourself some outs. I didn't do that, but no, I mean, I think that what you said is like spot on that the video mo in most cases is not the best way to get people's attention and it serves as like this deeper funnel awareness almost like more of an ascension artist type play maybe if you if you want to refer to it that way so yeah i mean i just maybe clarify what i what i meant to say but i do stand by the fact that like for grassroots artists starting out you don't need a music video you're better off doing a performance video I agree with you, for the record. Uh, there's no part of that that I uh, disagree with. I am, you know, occasionally hired to help grassroots artists make these over-budget music videos, and it's not my place to tell them it's not worth doing. But I wish I could, because it's just... That's like people will like will like really push the envelope and like borrow money to make these videos. That the concept is bad to begin with. The worst kind of music video you can spend two thousand dollars on <laughs> is uh, taking your band 
to like an abandoned warehouse or something and hiring a cinematographer to, to record you miming your instruments to the track. Those music videos are being generated like every single day here in Nashville. And like you immediately know what it is and you ignore it. It's just, they're just so vapid. Great business for like aspiring videographers because there's so much demand. Everyone's making those videos. And the fact that everyone is producing these videos makes it look like that's what you're supposed to be doing. Everyone's making this kind of music video that looks like this. So I got to do it because I'm legit. But that's just, again, it's a lack of critical thinking. It is a feedback loop for sure. It's, it's an unfortunate one to behold, but it is what it is. When you find yourself in the situations where you can make these recommendations and you're kind of heading things up outside of your own music, Michael, what are some pieces of advice, you know, a few like, pieces of advice for artists that are thinking about going into producing a video for the first time. And they are between something more of a traditional music video or going in this direction uh, that's more performance based or just in general, like what tips would you give kind of off the cuff here that you think are most important for artists to know when it comes to making video? Uh, em embrace your limitations for sure. Don't try and produce something that you're not confident you can do well. Don't try and make something that looks sleek and professional if you really have never done that before because that's gonna work against you. Anything that gets in, in between you and like a sincere performance or a sincere video is gonna work against you. When you're producing video content yourself, it's very easy to get frustrated with all the technical stuff and, and that impacts that makes it not fun and then that impacts the quality of whatever you're, you're recording when you're doing it alone and it takes experience recording yourself and you gotta get over you know performance anxiety for instance if you not if you're not used to having a camera pointed at you and that's something that i've worked on myself i've have gotten better at it over time if you're just starting out and this this is the case all the way down but it's just what is being captured on camera is in fact the most important thing with top of funnel ad stuff, even beyond. I've taken so much inspiration from Bo Burnham's special inside. I'm actually wearing a shirt from it right now. And I think so there's so much inspo to glean from that if you're, if you're recording videos yourself, especially if you're a solo artist. And that's like the perfect intersection of unfettered performance and like musical and, and lyrical intrigue and high quality production value. There, he put like months and months of pre-production in, into that, and who knows how many takes he did of everything to get the ones that made the cut. I mean, he does cut all of his like all of his like labor into into that special, and that is what makes it so compelling. Part of it is seeing him like setting up cameras and whatnot. But when the camera's rolling, you know, it's not thinking about it, or at least he doesn't appear to be. It's a, it's a very, it's a very elegant series of examples that I would encourage anybody to find inspiration from. I think that's a great example of like, knowing that what you need to focus on is the thing that's being captured on camera. I think that that's such a great one. Inside is a great example of that, but also that's just a great piece of advice for sure. That's so good. Make sure it's being captured clearly, you know, on a technical level. If you just have one camera and you just put it on a, on a tripod, you can't really angle it in a good way or a bad way. Just make sure you're visible and completely in it. If you have two cameras, have that one wide and the second one on your face or your hands or something. As far as like starting out and knowing where to put the cameras, just make sure we can clearly see what you're doing because that, that sounds like common sense, but uh, I, sometimes, sometimes it, it's not. I do see videos that are just, this is also a lighting thing too. It's too dark to really see what's going on or it's so grainy or like the shot crops part of the guitar. So like if it's a, if it's just an acoustic performance video and I can't see you actually playing the guitar completely, then that, you know, kind of detracts a lot of, of what you have to offer from the video. So I don't know, I feel like I just throw that, that common sense thing out there. No, that's really good. I think that that's supremely important and easily overlooked, especially in, in an era where it's just like, oh, I'll just have a webcam up or I'll use my phone or something. And that's really what kind of separates like amateur looking videos from professional ones. I think that that's such good advice. 
Do you have any resources or, or tools that you would recommend for artists who, you know, aren't necessarily looking to ape into video in a professional sense, but are trying to get the most out of what they need to do? Resources in terms of education. I know we're in the process of putting together training on video in particular, which is very exciting to have inside of Indie Pro. But in general, like stuff that you found insightful or useful over the years as you've learned, and also just like, you know, tools and editing software that you like. I know, I, I believe you're a premier guy, but there's plenty of stuff out there. Yeah, the video training, which is um, just a module in a larger training about promoting with video is done. It's all out. So I would point you to that. I made this training, obviously, and I get into a lot of the nitty gritty and uh, also like have some resources in that that I, I refer to. If you're a Premiere user, there's some like really, really useful plugins that make editing a lot easier, especially if you're new to it. They're just like great shortcuts to doing a lot of things. This one in particular is called Premiere Composer. It's from a website called mrhorse.com. It is free. It is incredible that it's free. It doesn't have like mind bending special effects, which uh, I want nothing to do with anyway, as far as like presets go. But it's a really, really practical tool to use. Um, there are probably equivalent tools for like Final Cut if you're using that or, or whatever. Um, if you're using iMovie, I don't really have any ex experience with that. So you should try and move away from iMovie. iMovie isn't easier to use than Premiere or Final Cut. They just like reduce a lot of the features. So if you're frustrated with iMovie, you might actually have an easier time with a more sophisticated program. There's one other thing I was gonna say. Oh yeah, just learning shortcuts, especially if you're already doing this, you're not using shortcuts. Not necessarily like cutting edge uh, insider information here, but like pull up the shortcuts window and uh, study that if you're, if you're editing, because if you're not using shortcuts, you're just having a terrible experience. That was definitely one of my biggest learnings working in, in the studio, you know, working in Pro Tools or Logic or whatever was like, get the key commands down, get fast. It's going to make your life easier. <laughs> Seriously, I learned all the shortcuts out of necessity. I barely touch my mouse when I'm editing. It's all about reducing uh, how much you have to touch the mouse, really, and, and clicks. This advice extends to any any software design or creative software out there. Just, you know, learn your, learn your shortcuts for sure. With camera stuff, this training I did was pretty, pretty extensive, so I would, I would defer anyone to looking at that for technical stuff about cameras and whatnot. YouTube videos are fucking amazing. Um, and for inspo, like, I really study the videos that I like. A video that I, that I see that really inspires me that I want to reproduce, like, I study, like, how the cameras are moving, like, what the shots look like, you know, like, how shallow is the depth of field, how is it lit, and everything. And just, like, critically studying the stuff that you enjoy or that you want to produce goes a long way beyond just, you know, watching it on a surface level. Analyze what makes a compelling video for you. That's really what I'm basing a lot of what I'm doing and, and a lot of my opinions off of. That's great advice, man. We'll link to uh, the Premiere Composer in the show notes, and we'll also link to Indie Pro where you can dive into the new Promote with Video training and kind of get the insider tips straight from Michael in an extended kind of setting. A super, super exciting. Man, thank you so much for coming on here. This was so much fun. We definitely got to have you back on again. It's just a blast to get to hear more about your story and let everybody else know what you do. So thanks for coming to hang out. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I'll be, I'd be happy to return anytime. Awesome, man. Well, where can people find you and listen to your music and check out your work? I am at Kytoon Music, K-Y-T. O-O-N. You can find my music videos through that too. I don't have like a portfolio website as a videographer. I actually don't need to do a lot of like outreach to stay busy. So I constantly put it off, but uh, you can at least uh, check out what what's going on there. I'm on Instagram. That's where most of, most of the action happens and YouTube, obviously. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for being here. Indies, I hope that hearing Michael talk about some of the best practices that he knows and just some tips for making videos and video ads and music videos that don't suck gets you inspired for creating throughout the rest of this year 
and puts you on the right track if you're in the middle of uh, either in the middle of the project or, or diving into one for the very first time. So check out uh, what we've linked to in the resources in the show notes. We'll catch you guys next time on Creative Juice. Peace out, indies. Uh-huh. Can't get really-